We have three great uh, speakers tonight, and uh, we will start with uh, Yakov, and uh, then we, we have uh, Ray Zhang here, and we finish with uh, Julien. Okay. And uh, yeah, then we can have some Q and A and uh, hang out. After this, we can chat and uh, have a beer somewhere. And have a, if you guys have a, re a recommendation after this, a suggestion. Yeah. Okay. So yes, without further ado. No, I like the show start. I talk afterwards. I talk to them. Okay, let's start. My name is Jacob Payne. I live here in New York City. I do Angular and I know Java. And these days I do mainly Angular consulting because there's a big demand for consulting, training, code reviews, and so on. This is the recent book. Don't buy it because we already started working on the second edition. It'll be even better than this one. Like in a month, many will start their new app program, so you can start getting new materials. I already wrote like a half of the second edition. So before I start, could you please tell me who in this room didn't do Angular before? Anyone? Okay, not too many, but still. Is anybody who didn't do job? No. All right, so now I know what to talk about. Two parts of my presentation. It's short. I usually speak for a while, a long time, but I, I got only like half an hour, so I'll try to be short. Still, I will cut it in two parts. Because Jay Hipster is like some kind of a voodoo magic, and the typical presentation on Jay Hipster is see, I, I click yes, no, yes, no, yes, boom, it works. But what I want to do, first half of the presentation, I'll show you. Without J. Hipster. There is a life without J. Hipster as well. Not a great life, of course, but there is. So you can generate Angular on the front, generate Spring Boot, and deploy. I'll explain you how this works under the hood. So when I switch to J. Hipster, you will get a better idea of what's going on. <coughs> so what I will do, I will start a little Spring Boot uh, server, and I will uh, take an Angular app connect to the Spring Boot server, I'll explain you how developers work. What is a typical developer's environment? If you're a Java developer, wanted to work with Angular as well, how does, how does, how does it work? Where do you start the server, where is the client, and so on. And then we'll switch to jhipster. But the main message is that jhipster is a framework that allows you to write less code. And in my opinion, any good framework should allow you to, to write less code. And uh, the same goes with Spring Boot. Generate stuff for you and you just add something to it. You don't need to worry about which packages work with which packages and so on. Same thing with Angular. A year ago people complained. People who were moving from Angular to S to Angular saying there is too many configuration files, I need to learn this and that back and TypeScript and so many configurations. So they created a tool called Angular CLI. Again, it's a code generator. So you generate the front end, you generate the Spring Boot on the back, and you can make them talk together. And finally, you can take the hipster and generate everything. Front end and back end, and everything somehow works. And you can even deploy it on various clouds and stuff. So Spring Boot, it's a runtime for Spring Project, so you can quickly get started. There's a site called startspring.io. Go there, select the options what you want, and in minutes you have a Java application up and running. Uh, I have only half an hour, so I, I will not be doing this. I will not be generating in front of you, but trust me, it works as, as promised. So what I will do, I will show you the project that I already generated within two minutes. Spring Boot Project, just Java. So the goal of this uh, server is to provide you some data, like REST server, offering you products. Take a look, it's super simple, but at least you can understand what's, what it does. This is my database, right? I have three products. And I have a, a class, product control. Up on top, you see that I am mapping this class to the API fragment of the URL. It's an endpoint. Whenever the server gets hit with a URL that has 
API, it will get this request. And down there, I have product that is meant to uh, the request method get and to this particular method. So if I have a URL with API slash products, in Spring Boot automatically will redirect it to this method. What this method does? It returns products, right? That's it. So if this works, I'm supposed to get back JSON with three products from my database. Spring Boot would automatically convert the array into JSON. All right, so what I will do, I will be using uh, IntelliJ AD as an ID for everything, front end and back end. I will start this server, which I already generated, I mean the boot server. And this is, this is what's there. As I, as I showed you on the slide, this little file, the product, it's a value object, and a little application, nothing else. So I will just start it, I can run it as Maven or Gradle, but I will just start it from my ID. It'll bring up the server on port 8080. Then I load to the browser and do HTTP localhost 8080. <coughs> and let's see if I will get my three products back. No front end, nothing, just JSON. Let me go there. Is it done yet? I'll go to, to the browser, localhost 8080, and it responds. See, it responded with something, but not with my product. Why it happened? Because I didn't provide an endpoint for slash. Remember, I provided an endpoint for API slash product. So it hits the server, the server says, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know how to redirect your request. That's why I'm getting back standard Spring Boot response. So let's fix that. So what I will do, I will say slash API slash product, right? And now we got it. That's my product. I, I'm getting JSON. No angular yet, but at least I have server up and running. Now, the next step, I want to take an angular app and consume this JSON. Right? So you will see the script. Now let's go, go back to slides. Let the server uh, run. What's angular? It's also a framework for developing a price application. Excellent framework, better included, and uh, MIT license, which is important. Nice tooling. We write in TypeScript. TypeScript is very easy to learn for Java development. As a matter of fact, last week I did a presentation on TypeScript at Java User Group here in New York. So, what is Angular CLI? It's a code generator. It'll get you started with it. You install it on your computer, you run the command, boom, you get a project with all configurations with everything. Next, so I generated a file with one command, there's a project, sorry, and my, this is my client. My client will have this component. Angular framework consists of modules. Inside the modules, we have components. It's a component-based framework, not an MVC. Component-based framework, and we have services. It supports dependency injection, so you can inject a service into component. Component is a class with the UI. Look at this. Uh, export class ABP component. That's a class in TypeScript. This code is in TypeScript. Up on top is what in Java we know as annotations. It's about metadata. But in TypeScript we call it decorator. But it is what it is. So this class became a component because I had an add component decorator. In there, you can put template, which is markup, you can put CSS, and so on. So in this case, I have a title h one of products and UL, an order list, which will loop through an array of my products and will create a like, a like, a like elements for each of them. That's pretty much it. But how do we get the data? We get the data. Over here, we do HTTP GET. HTTP GET. There's a class called HTTP Client on Angular. You inject it. How do you inject it in Angular? You just declare a constructor with this argument on this side. And Angular not. Oh, they want this constructor. Let me inject it. I will not go into details. There are various different types of injections. So, assume that I get the instance of this 
HTTP objects from Angular, and I do HTTP GET. And as you can see, I specify API slash product, the endpoint that I configured on the server. Correct? And there's a trick to this. Actually, a bit later. So, uh, Angular internally uses the library called RxJS. If anybody is familiar with reactive programming, RxJava maybe, it's the same thing. Observable, observers, operators, and so on. So, when the HTTP returns with the data, it returns it as an item in observable. You subscribe to it. So, in this case, I say, I declare the data source, and now I say subscribe. When the data comes back, I take the data and I put it inside the product. Product is what? It's an array of strings. This is generic, by the way, you understand that. And this product is used in the template and G4. It will look through this array for each element of the little render alert. This is it. Not too difficult, right? And before I run this, I will show you the problem, but first let me explain this problem. Angular CLI comes with a dev server. As, the, as developers, we want to run our own uh, web server for the UI. Under the code, Angular CLI uses Webpack, which is a bundler. Webpack as a server, Angular CLI uses it. So, to start the UI, you run a command from Angular CLI in G server. It will start its own server on the port. 4200. So this is how our app will be served from this little dev server on port 4200. Now we have a situation. Our Spring Boot runs on port 88. It's a different server, right? So if, if my app came from port 4200 and it will start reaching out to a different server on different port, we can get an error. There is a special restriction for security reasons, the same origin restriction. So if I came from port 4200, I can talk back to port 4200, unless I will do some proxy. So we want to do some proxy, otherwise we'll get an error. So what do I do? Yeah, so if I, if this, if the code which does HTTP get arrives from port 4200 and tries to reach out to 88, it'll get an error. So how, do we, how can we do this? There are a couple of ways to, to do that. We can either uh, change the headers on our dev server, saying whenever uh, you get it, you redirect to the other server. Or you can write it this time a file on the client, saying whenever the HTTP request has slash API, like in my case, redirect it to port to local host 88. Mm -hmm. If you do this, uh, then we will have a dev server running Angular and the uh, REST server on Spring Boot. When we deploy everything, you don't need a proxy and everything, but in the dev mode, this is how it works. Down there, on the last slide of the slide, this is how you start the command. ng serve, and then specify, use this proxy file. ng serve will build the bundles in memory, so if you have 100 files, it'll be bundled up into a small number of files, minimize and everything in production mode, so you can run. So let me do this. So what I will do now, I will go back to the UI, but I will go to a different project. That server is still running. I'm going to the client. This is my client, right? This is my app component. That's the file that you saw on the slide. That's the guy. So what I will do, I will do in GSurf, last line in the slide, and GSurf proxy config is the name of the file. It will start building <coughs> the bundles down there. It builds the bundles in memory. In dev mode, we build everything in memory. For production, you would run different commands to produce files, but for now, we don't need it. So it will build the bundles, it is there already, and now I can go and to the port localhost 8080. So let me go to another one. Localhost 8080, sorry, 4200. And I got this, the, the data. See, it went to 4200. Proxy and send it to the 8080, and now I get the data. So it works. How the production deployment works in Angular? Production deployment. <coughs> you write scripts. There are different tools on the front end, uh, like Grunt or Gulp, something like uh, 
similar maybe to Maven. And you need to automate, you need to automate your build. And, and uh, Node.js is our runtime engine on the front end. It has a package manager, NPM. NPM supports scripts. So you can write a couple of scripts and uh, arrange the build automation. In this case, I, run, I have a build script, post build script, and going to do Building name convention, which I will not go into now. I will run uh, NPM, run build, and it will execute all these commands. The last one, as you can see, it removes a directory from this older deployment, create a new one, and copy file from the disk directory to the, to the server directory. I have this client and server like sibling directories. I go one level up, then to server, and I copy it there. ng-build, as opposed to ng-serve, is the command that will produce files in the disk directory, and then the script will copy them all. So, let me show you real quick. If I will, uh, if I, this is client, I'll go back to the server. This is the server. In the server, I have resources. I have static folder, but it's empty. There is nothing there. My client, my bundles will be copied now over there. Let me show you. I'll go back to client now. I, I, I control C this guy, and I do ng build. Sorry, sorry, sorry. npm run build. npm run build script. Build script is configured in the package JSON, which is uh, uh, something similar to what we know in Java as POM XML, mail, right? In this world, it's package JSON. This is going to specify dependency and script. So that part is done. It's already built and copied. The folder dist. Uh, was created here with the bundle. This is all, all our app, but also it was copied over to the server. In the server, if I'll click on static now, now you see all the bundles are there. So my app is deployed. Let me restart the server, and now I will again run the front end client, but I will not be going through this 40, 40 to 100 port. I'll, I'll directly hit the boot server, and it will serve me the same process. So let me go there. So instead of 40 to content, I'll do 88. So that's a production deployment and it works. So what did, what did I show you? A, how to start uh, Spring Boot server. B, how to uh, start front end on different port. How to configure proxy and how to do a deployment. Yeah, well, obviously it's very fast, but I have only half enough. Next. Going back to slides. Now we are switching to JKIFT. JKIFT uses a whole bunch of different generators under the code. In particular, it uses so called Yeoman generator. It's a generator for different languages, different packages, and so on. Allows you to quickly generate stuff. So JKIFT is one of the generators that Yeoman can use and produce you the starting app. You can go to jkipster.tech and see the documentation on the whole uh, project. More than 500,000 downloads. It's an open source project, by the way. 8,000 starts, which is very impressive. 350 contributors. So if you think that Julian is the guy who is our bottleneck, no. If tomorrow he will leave and start working for uh, JP Morgan, there are 349 people left. So don't be afraid. So why do we want to use it? Because we can jump start the app. Wait, think about it. If you need to manually write a string app, if you need to manually write an Angular app, all this configuration, with jhipster it's done. Also, so you'll get a starting crowd app quickly. And you can uh, pick different type of deployments, and Ray will talk about one of them. I will show you the manually deployment uh, today. But everything is matched and works together nicely. There are a couple of ways of generating JHipster projects. Either you can go online, similar to Spring, uh, start Spring.io. You go in there, nice and neat, nice and simple page with checkboxes, and you say, I want one of the deployment, I want this database, that database, and so on. Click, 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 zip is downloaded. 
or if you are not afraid of installing stuff, which I am not. You can install everything. You can install a bunch of things on your computer and run local code generation. In any case, if you go one way or the other, you need a new machine, Maven or Gradle. You need Node.js, and you need Yard package management. So, uh, again, get generating an app online, you go to this site, uh, which looks like this. That's the site. You you need to do like maybe five or seven clicks at all, and then the button download zip, and you got a zip with both front end and back. Then you need to build. It. How do you build it? You run a Maven wrapper, one command for the server, and uh, you you also want to work in the dev mode, like I showed you uh, that I make changes to server reboot, the server builds the bundles in memory, and then it talks to the spring boot server. So the second command you run the arm the arm stuff. So that's a dev mode. If you don't want to work in dev mode, if it goes in production, you don't need the arm start. For the same, same reason like I showed you before. You don't need proxy or anything. If you want to install it manually from local install jhipster, you need to run install yeoman command, install jhipster, create some new folder for your project, cd into it, and then run the command jhipster. This is what I will do. When you run this command jhipster, you will see a screen like this. It will ask you a dozen, maybe 15 questions. All of them have default answers to you again. Click, 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 and the start generation. It asks you, what do you want to generate? Monolithic app, or maybe you want to uh, app with microservices. What database do you want to use? Do you want to use SQL-based database, or maybe no SQL database? Uh, do you want to use Hibernate? Uh, what do you want to use, Maven or Gradle? So all that you answer, and uh, again, Angular 4, maybe Angular 1. Do you want to do in internationalization? Do you need to, your UI to be done in, in multiple languages? Very easy. You can select, uh, there are probably like 40 different languages you can pick from. You can select English as a primary language, then other as a third, and so on. And it will generate this project. In this project, you have Java sources in the Java folder, Angular sources in the web app folder, which is correct because JavaScript stuff, HTML, CSS, from the server's perspective, is static resources, right? So this is very good stuff. Now, dependencies, it will generate your files with dependency. Angular dependencies are in package JSON. Java dependencies are in form XML. This should be familiar to you. When this code is generated, this is your project. Open it up, customize it, change whatever you want, change the sources. And there are different models of building your project. One of the ways to build it is to, to build a WAR file. The WAR file that contains everything. Java and Angular. You, you run it, and then you just go to local host 8080 and it works. If you want to do it in production, you need to start the production database. During the project generation, it gives you a chance uh, to use this in memory uh, toy database from Java like H2. But it can, it, it's a database that's persistent still. But for production, you select, you want to use MySQL, SQL Server, Oracle, or whatever else you want. So for production, you need to run somewhere an instance of the database. In dev, if you want to run in there, then you will need to do something similar with this proxy. So you will run a uh, wrapper to start the server on port 88. Then you need to install dependencies of the Angular, and then you do your start, which will run it on the port 9000. Similar thing that I showed you, 4200, 88. In this case, 9000 port, 88. So the idea is the same. At least now you understand what's going on under the hood. Internationalization. If you will pick, if you will pick, if you will answer, yes, I want internationalization, it will ask you to pick the language. Second one, the third one, and so on. And it will generate for you under the folder I, uh, I Q, N, some folders for the languages that you pick. These files, these JSON files, are files in different languages. So when you will see the app, you will have a menu like switch to French, switch to, in this case, it's Ukrainian. Uh, so you can uh, pick and choose easy switch, 
And if you want to change the UI, you go here and you change the text. And let's let's try to generate this app and uh, and see how this how this goes. So what I will do, what I will do, where am I? I'm in the root directory. I will create a directory um, called NYC. And I will switch to this directory. I already have all these tools installed, like Yeoman, Yar, so I don't need to install it, Node.js, everything is there. So what I will do, I will run jhipster. jhipster. And it'll give me this uh, prompt. So it asks me, and it offers me the default key that blue line. Do you want to do monolithic app for microservices or just gateway? If I would be selecting microservices, I would need to run this procedure twice. One for the gateway, this is where the front end will live. And then for each microservice, I would need to generate a different project. I select the uh, uh, monolithic I want. Uh, What's the base name of the app? By default, it's the name of the directory and my C's, that's fine. The name of the, of the package, you can change it, I won't. Uh, do you want to use the hipster register to configure monitor uh, your, your app? Uh, you can use register and there is an alternative, like console. I will say no, I don't want to uh, register for this one. Really. What kind of authentication do you want? JWT uh, or, or something else? I will do the JWT with a token. What? Database do you want? What type? SQL or maybe not? I pick SQL, but you could pick uh, MongoDB and Cassandra as well. SQL. Now, which SQL database do you want? You can pick something, but for production. So for production, I want to yeah, I'll keep it to MySQL. For development, what do you want to use? For development, I want to use H2 with persistence. It'll generate for me all the code for the databases as well. All right, so H2 is fine. Now, uh, what, are you, what, what kind of caching mechanism do you, do you want to use? Cache, 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 uh, let, let it be a cache. What do you want to use, Maven or Gradle? Maven. See, I didn't enter anything. I just hit enter, enter, enter. I didn't type. Now, social login if you need, which I don't. The rich library for the front end, Angular 4, which is the latest one, until September. Then you do want to use uh, SAS or just regular CSS. I will use regular CSS. Uh, do you want to do an internationalization support? Let me say yes. Then they'll ask you what's the primary language? Uh, it's uh, English. And then pick another one. I'm originally from Ukraine, so I'll pick Ukraine if you don't mind. So do you need additional frameworks? No. Do you want uh, to install other generators? No. So generation start. Generation start. So now it install all dependency. It takes a minute because it installs all dependency for Java and all dependencies for Angular. When it's done, like another 20 seconds, we have to create. I will take maybe more, five more times so they don't understand other people need to say something to Do you have any questions, by the way? No? Not too fast? Yeah. Um, will it be supporting Mongo? Which one? Will JFT be supporting uh, Mongo? Will it be allowed to put the other issues? Yes. And by the way, Julian, uh, today we'll be talking about bright future of the hipster, so you can ask him and give him some ideas of what it is. So it's done. The project is ready. So I just need to start. It tells you what you need to do. I need to start the server, main wrapper, and then in development mode, like I did uh, with manual project, yarn start. So in this uh, folder, I will do maven. Maven W. I don't want to open the ID again because I don't have time. And over here, I will go uh, to, a to the same directory, which was NYC. 
As you can see, this was generated for the form XML to Java packages you can support in front end. Right? So in this mode, I will run uh, yarn start. Yarn build the underscore that, under that uses webpack to build the bundles again, and uh, it will build the bundle. I don't see if the, if the server generated. Yeah, it is generated, see? I already, so now I, I'm running on port 88, I'm running Spring Boot. On port 9000, I'm, I'm running front end, both of the proxy. So that's the, that's the, the, the app. And uh, what, what happens, as you can see, language, right? I, I, I click Ukrainian. Anybody speak Ukrainian? No? One person, see? Can you prove that it's in Ukrainian? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't lie to you. And you can pick anything, any, uh, any language that you want. Now, you already have a couple of accounts, and you can create more users, but one of them is admin admin. I will use this one. I made a spelling mistake, or what? I don't know why it doesn't make me mistake. Let me try again. Try me. Do you start the database? Do you have a database? But it's not production mode. I, I should oh, have yeah, yeah. You so may have your idea running. Oh. 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 I know why. I know why. Take a look. Ah. Oh. 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 How cool is it? I started with that port. Remember the manual spring boot. So, so I need to kill it. Let me kill that guy <laughs> with three nice products. I didn't want to kill it. No, I, I did. <laughs> so let me do that again. Uh, this one, certification paper start. See, you need to read log files. <laughs> but I didn't. Let me restart the server. That's why I didn't want me to log in. See, it's a real thing. Restarting the server. Supposed to give you a message at the end that it's running on port 88. Liquid base is the thing, it's like a git for the database. It keeps track of all the changes in the database. Now it starts. Let me go back here. So now let me try uh, sign in. Admin. Admin. Different story. So now you see, if, you, if I would uh, sign in as user, user, then I wouldn't see this in any administration. But since I'm admin, it gives me this nice little set of features. It allows me to create users. It allows me to show, to see some metrics of the app right away. It uh, helps of the app. Mm, configuration. Uh, what else? Uh, logs. Logs, and you, you can change this log, the level of these logs, and, My screen is too big. So the level of logging, you can change it over here as well. So now, entities. I don't have them here because I didn't provide any database, any schema for the database yet. I don't have time now. I will just show you uh, what would I do on slides. And then I would have the submenu under entities so I could add entities. And UI is already there, by the way. So let me go back to slides and I will wrap it up. Ray is looking at me angrily. Maybe he has a lot to say. No? No, I'm not So, the Hips guys created a nice uh, little tool called JDL Studio. It's a UI in the browser. If you go and you can create a diagram for your database, for your entities, one to many, one to one, many to many, and so on. Then you can uh, download it. This schema is a simple text file, and if I if I would do this, I can put it online to your the hipster report, and uh, that export file would come in. Re restart the 
PF, and all of a sudden, under the entity menu, you see, for example, in my case, it would be categories of beers and beer. Right, so you can add new categories, edit categories, edit beers, and so on. It's already worked. And then, this is a diagram from the, doc from the documentation of Jay Hipster. You can select a different model. I picked the monolithic, but you don't have to. You can pick more advanced models when <coughs> where you have a gateway, it's a server, and you have one or more microservices. They are servers. Under the gateway, you'd be deploying your front end, and it has a whole bunch of different tools uh, for load balancing, then uh, you have uh, the hipster console, so I'll do this elastic search, logging. Then on the left hand side, you can pick and choose either go with the uh, hipster registry uh, for service discovery, or you can go with this console. It's a different, uh, it's another alternative. And if, if, if I would go with console, I would start it on different ports microservice one, microservice two, and so on, one per port. Council would be on the port 8500. By default, this is a discovery place, so the server could be found or re registered if you need to change. The gateway would be the end to get the server where my front end is, and this is where I am, the user. And again, how, do, how would you create all these servers? You just need to repeat the generation process first for the gateway, or then for the microservices, or then. Like I, like I just did. And these comments uh, show you how to start. By the way, if you go to slideshare.net, uh, I uploaded these slides over there. Why think? Slideshare.net, find me over there, and you will see this, these slides, and you can download them. We have a bunch of different deployments, and we'll hear about one of them today. And that's about it. Thank you very much. Now Ray will be talking. Oh, it's your recording. Shoot. Let's make it quick. See, my computer is almost out of power, so I gotta make it really, really quick for me as well. Uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, JHipster uh, Kubernetes Generator. My name is Ray, I'm a developer advocate for the Google Cloud Platform. You can find me on Twitter. Uh, that's probably the best place to find me as well. And just so you know, if you don't know Google Cloud, we have a bunch of um, cloud technology from VMs to platform as a service, to big data solutions, machine learning, whatever. So if you wanna learn more, just uh, find me afterwards. We got a few Googlers here that can help you answer your question. So we got Ludo and Damien. So um, there was a um, little overview of the, the microservices architecture that JHipster is generate. Just take a look at this picture though in closer. We have many, many components here. There's a gateway, there's a UAA server, uh, there are a bunch of microservices that you could generate, there's the console that you could deploy, there's a registry, whether you use console or JHipster registry, doesn't matter. By the way, there's also a database that's not shown here. How do you actually deploy all of these things easily, right? You can, of course, use Docker, Docker uh, Compose and stuff like that, but how do you actually scale it out? Um, in my mind, one of the best places to run this uh, in a production environment is actually managing all of these applications with Kubernetes. How many people here heard about Kubernetes before? Yeah, quite a few, okay. Yeah, so very, very high level, very quickly in like one minute. It's a container orchestration tool that was open sourced by Google initially. It is now owned by the Cloud Native Foundation. So it's a, a tool that you can use to basically orchestrate whatever processes you want to run uh, that as soon as you're containerized. Basically, it works like this. You push a container image to a central repository somewhere. You save what you want to deploy to the cluster, to the Kubernetes master and node, that's like the controller. And once you have done that, there's a scheduler behind the scenes that will then pick and choose the machines that can actually run your applications. Uh, so a single cluster in Kubernetes can have you know, one node, two nodes, or 5,000 nodes, right? It doesn't matter how many machines you have, 
you just need to tell it what you want to deploy and how many instances you want, and we'll deploy it for you. Okay? Um, and typically, you need to write uh, a lot of configuration to be able to deploy your container into Kubernetes the proper way. And with jhipster, uh, with the Kubernetes generator, we actually generate all of these things for you automatically. Okay? Um, and basically, this is what we're going to do. We're going to put all of these components into a Kubernetes cluster. And the reason I'm here is actually I created the first initial uh, ask about having this done, and I tried to do the, the, the pool, uh, the pull request. I failed, I failed miserably. Uh, just to, so you know who the credit should go to, it's Pierre and Pascal. They have done a lot of work around this um, and helping me to get that commit committed. So definitely, uh, if you have questions, uh, ask them. <laughs> it's been a while since I touched the, the, the generator myself, but that was I had the first commit. That's all that matters. All right. So with the with the generator, I'm just going to go through this very quickly. Uh, basically, if I go, I have already the the application um, generated. I got the gateway, which um, Yakov talked about. I got a microservice behind the scenes. I just got one. Uh, what I can do is I can do um, well, make a Kubernetes direct. Oh, that's not how you spell Kubernetes. Is that? No, that's not. All right. So I'm going to say KS just to make it easy. And all I need to do is to say uh, jhipster Kubernetes. Now I'm going to do this properly. Okay. And I can say, well, this is a microservices application. And they are in root. I can say which ones I want to deploy. I got the gateway in the microservice. Uh, I can send my password. Not everybody knows what it is. Uh, what namespace, uh, these are just uh, um, Kubernetes configuration. I can also say where I want to publish my Docker containers to. Uh, since I'm on Google Cloud, I'm going to use my registry on Google Cloud Platform directly, so I don't, it's a private registry. And then by default, you can push your containers with Docker push. Uh, because I'm on Google Cloud, I'm going to use something slightly different, uh, which is uh, G Cloud Docker dash dash push, whatever. All right? Do I want Elk? Yes, maybe. Do I want the Prometheus for monitoring? No, not right now, because it didn't work for me. <laughs> and, then, and then you can pick and choose how you want to expose your application uh, in Kubernetes. There are multiple ways you can expose the application. I'm going to use the easiest one, which is a public IP address. After you have done all of that, it generates all the files for you. And this is the deployment, the load balancer configuration, and the database configuration as well. And all you need to do is to First, create the image, which I have already done. It tells you all the command lines you need to push this image out to a central registry. Remember that graph I showed you? And then, all you need to do is to copy and paste these command lines. So, what this is actually doing is to take the YAML files that we're generating and deploy it into a real cluster. So, I'm deploying it into my cluster with five nodes. Okay, that's running on Google Cloud right now, but it doesn't matter what you run with Kubernetes. Uh, although Google Cloud is probably the best place. But you can run this in Minikube, you can run this in another Kubernetes installation. Right, so I can deploy the console, I can deploy the registry, uh, and I'm going to deploy the gateway. Oh, sorry, the, the gateway last, maybe. I'm going to deploy the microservice, okay? And the gateway. Now, you might be saying, well, that seems a little bit too easy. Well, it is. Every one of these command line is deploying a production-ready deployment where you can have, you can actually scale out the number of instances of your microservices. Uh, they actually have a SQL database behind it, uh, and it has a registry, it has all the configurations that you have done. All right, so let me see how this is going. All right, I'll be done in a few minutes. So here I have everything that's running in my cluster, and I got the gateway, I got the MySQL for the gateway. What does MySQL, what does gateway need MySQL? Oh yeah, it has the, the users, users, right? I have the console, I got Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Registry, this is HA uh, installation as well. And I got my microservice here that has a database behind it too. And eventually, I will, oh no, not again. All right, so, <laughs> so let me see here. Everything's almost up and running. And what you can do then is to get the service IP address, which will tell you how to do. And you can grab this IP. You can hopefully go to the IP address and go to 48080, and eventually this will come up. Now, let me see here. Oh yeah, it's still loading, so it's not coming up yet. But once this application starts, uh, this, app, this, uh, this microservices architecture will just be deployed in Kubernetes, orchestrated, and you don't have to worry about 
applications this is dying because we'll just automatically restart it for you. You can scale out your microservices, we'll just automatically register with the, the registry and it will be automatically low balanced for you as well. So that's all I have. And I didn't want to take a lot of time. I just want you to be aware of that such a thing exists uh, and you can actually run your entire microservices architecture in Kubernetes with your hipster. And if you like to run it in a platform service, uh, definitely talk to Ludo in the back, and he has some of the best places you can run a Java application. Okay, very quickly out of the box, we can support in Kubernetes and MariaDB, MySQL, Postgres, and MongoDB. Somebody asked, uh, and we have registry for uh, Eureka or Console. We can provision all of these things for you directly in Kubernetes. But we generate all of these things for you, so that's pretty cool. And if you want to learn more, definitely just go to some of these links. And the last one is probably what you want. It's the, uh, the how-tos for uh, how to run this Kubernetes generator. All right. So if I have any luck, let me, oh, oh, it's already up and running. Sweet. So this is the application running. Yeah. And if I log in, and I'll be done. If I can log in, I don't know if I can. Come on, log in. Yeah, there we go. And here are my entities. I got hotels. Uh, so I got hotel and rooms. And if we go to the gateway, uh, we can actually see that this is actually going to route all my API calls to the backend services that's running inside of Kubernetes right now. If I, if I have more than one instances, you're going to see all of them, and you can see the status checks. All right, cool. And thank you for your time. Cheers. You. <laughs> That's why you said only 15 minutes because you go so fast. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I'll be around here as a question. Um, oh. So. Uh, it's. It's what? Oh no. Don't see the slides yet. Whoa, 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 don't look, don't look. <laughs> uh, so I'm going to do a slide on the roadmap and the new feature of JFSTOR because we have the introduction, because it's advanced deployment this way. And uh, I have some slides about describing what JFSTOR is, but I think it was already perfectly done before. So I'm just going to focus on the roadmap so we have more time on the roadmap and on the latest features. Um, so, I've got three big new features. The first one well, was shown by Yakov. It's a uh, JSTOR Online. So, it's on the start of the JSTOR Tech. Uh, it's basically well, the, the generator that people use on the command line, but now it's in the web application. Um, I don't think that would be successful, and now we've got tons of users, tons of people using it. We just saw a customer before, he loved it, everybody liked it. I loved it. So this is definitely something we're going to push. It's was just the first version, and we're going to improve it a lot. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going to do a small demo, because for doing demos, it's a lot easier for me, in fact. <laughs> just so people see what it's all about. So if I go to start.jibster.tech, uh, I'm logging in as a normal user. Uh, so I linked my GitHub account to my uh, application, and now also I've got this famous screen where you can have all the classical JavaScript questions, but as a, an Angular or JS, uh, an Angular form, uh, form. So it's, it's easier to use. Uh, I'm just going to give it a name. I don't know, Jimster New York. Uh, I'm going to do a application. Oh, and as I saw a lot of people speaking about the JSTOR registry. Uh, I'm going to select it. Uh, yes, I want to use the JSTOR registry. And well, so I've got tons of options. And at the end, I can either generate it on GitHub or download it as a zip file. I'm going to do it on GitHub. Um, it takes basically seven seconds to generate the app, push it to GitHub, and have everything ready. And I just go here, and as you can see, it's already on GitHub ready. With uh, the documentation that was generated uh, according to my choices. That's very easy to use. Uh, 
Uh, I can open it with Google Desktop. Um, let's clone it here. Uh, and I've got my app, which is, oh, sorry, too many. Oh. My app is here on my desktop. I just need to click on it. <coughs> and the IntelliJ will open it and it will just work. So that's really fun and easy. Uh, what we will add later is the entity support, what we showed is the physical studio. And that's very easy because as soon as we generate the app, I think entity is like the same process. Uh, so yeah, that's my whole app working uh, with just a few clicks. <coughs> I don't code anything, so I, uh, well, people find it much better. Um, so that's the first big news, and we're going to, to push it more improve it. The second big news is uh, Angular 4 is out of beta. Uh, so it's our uh, new default. So in fact, what I generated was with Angular 4. Uh, we needed like one year to work on this with lots of people, a lot of help. It was really hard to have uh, Angular 4 working uh, for several reasons. First of all, while Angular is not so easy. And the second one, we generate a lot of things. We don't do like a simple Hello World app. We have a, a complete and complex and so that well, we needed a lot of time to have everything working. Uh, we did also use work on Webpack, which we have, uh, so in development mode, something which is very uh, uh, fast and uh, with a whole lot of everything. And when we are in production mode, I mean something which is highly minified and highly efficient. And while well, both of those are specific works, and took a long time for, for that. Uh, and last thing, which is an issue with this is not the uh, is we now use Bootstrap 4, which is just out of beta, well, just in beta, sorry, out of alpha. And uh, it lacks a lot of components, a lot of things are not uh, finished yet. So we have a, a, a component library which is not uh, as rich as what we used to have in Angular JS1. But it, they are catching up and we are following that. So hopefully it will be better soon. Uh, third new uh, big thing from this year is. The version 3 of the GSO release, which has been discussed uh, several times. Uh, I'm going to do a demo, a, a quick demo, because it's better than those screenshots. Uh, so, as I generated my app and I selected uh, the, that I wanted the GSO registry, Docker, uh, what it did is that it created for me. Oh. Uh, yeah, a Docker Compose file for the Jitsub registry. So I just go to the main Docker and I've got uh, a Jitsub registry um, uh, Docker Compose configuration. So I just ask it to run it, starting it. So now if I go here to uh, the default port, it's not started yet, it's going to start very, very soon. Come on, come on, come on. Did I get anything wrong? Disconnecting. Oh, I didn't start Docker. Oh no, start, sorry, just me, clicking too quickly. I'm like three, and I'm clicking very, very quickly. <laughs> uh, so that is the, this is the digital registry. It does those three things, it's supposed to do only two things. Uh, the first thing it does, uh, it's uh, uh, a Netflix Eureka, uh, self discovery, uh, Server, the second thing it does, it's a Spring Cloud Config uh, server, so it takes to a Git server and push the Spring uh, configuration to all the, the instances. And the new thing that it does now, it's also, uh, well, the screens that Jacob showed about metrics, health check, and so on, they are now centralized here on the, on the GSO registry. So what's interesting here is that's a central point for Scaling, configuration, monitoring, testing, everything, which is of course easier. It's secure, so by default, those tools are usually not secure with the, the default Spring Boot uh, configuration. And our um, uh, UI now, because it wasn't also working before, the UI can be now refreshed automatically. So that's, uh, that's very good for, for end users. I'm just going here to Eureka, because at the moment I'm not running anything. Of course, I'm going to run my app. Uh, uh, so my, 
I'm going to run it in, in production mode because that will make a better demo. So I'm going to run my SQL with Docker and I'm going to run my app in production mode. So I'm just running Maven in production mode. It's going to take some time because it's going to do a lot of tests. You go back and test, front and test, and so on. But well, I'm just going to run in the back end. And we'll see. Uh, what's going to happen is that once my app is ready, it will be registered here. Where it will be configured through Visual Studio 3. It will be saved here in the directory. It will be also monitored so we can see everything. Uh, and why it tests and deploys everything, I'm going to go on with my slide. So now, those are our three big news, are for the news, those are the three biggest ones from this year. And for the next year, we've got a roadmap with uh, a lot of things, and as we will talk also at the end, lots of people can influence the roadmap, you know, it's an open source project, we've got 365 contributors. So there are tons of people who can add new stuff to the roadmap, and uh, uh, that's why not uh, too dark at the beginning, so it can change the flow. But there's not a big uh, uh, trend that we see that, that will probably happen. So the first one is Spring Boot 2, because they are now in Milestone 3. So the big risk will be like pretty soon. We already have a branch where Spring Boot 2 is working. Uh, basically, we have a few changes. It's mostly changing for people using Cassandra, but we don't have that many people using Cassandra. So it's, uh, it's not a really change for a lot of people. And the most important thing in Spring Boot 2 is that there are Spring Fly webhooks, but uh, it's an alternative to Spring MVC REST. It's fully really reactive, but it's very interesting for some in use cases. Uh, what's uh, uh, interesting with what we did with JSON, it tested everything. Uh, but what I noticed is that uh, uh, there's a lot of hype with reactive programming, but there is no performance test. Yet. Test, you don't know what, what, what you're doing. So, we tested everything. Uh, and we were just, honestly, I'm not as good as I would have thought they would be, especially with MongoDB. So, MongoDB would like to uh, uh, benefit a lot from being reactive, but in fact, I would test them uh, better, but it's not, uh, it's not good. Um, but, well, we still need to finish that. And what will happen at the end is that we have the option when we generate one is, we have the option have them reactive or not. So we will give you the documentation and best practices, but then after that, your choice, you will choose if you want it or not. So in the end, for normal users, it will not change a lot of things. It's new possibilities if you want them. Yeah? So the generating entities will still be to a JDM-like interface, or are you providing something else as well? Oh, this will be with the, well, either with the common line, either with the GDL, but we'll have a new option. Okay. It will be a new, uh, I don't know how we will call that, but be like reactive to okay. <laughs> something like that, probably. It, it would be very smart. Uh, so that, the performance tests were done by two of my friends at Bitcoin Virus, and so they already created everything. So basically, just transforming the code into templates, which is a lot easier than what they did. So they did also hard work. You just need to transform it into templates. So, so this is why I can say this is clearly done in the next few months. Uh, no big deal. Uh, the other big news, this is maybe bigger, is uh, support for React.js. So, uh, I'm sorry for the Google people. <laughs> 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 no, but we have uh, a lot of people asking us to support React, uh, for various reasons. Uh, but it's quite high today. Uh, we have uh, a lot of work which has already been done by Tifu and Sandy, which are two of the big contributors to, to GFSTAR. Uh, so they did, well, most of the data decisions are, are done. A lot of work has been done. Uh, but this is already looking quite good. And what's also very good is that I should start on Monday uh, working for a client who's, who's, who sponsors uh, that feature in open source that wants to wish to release a project with a very big benchmark. They're not very used to open source, but on the other hand, they want to contribute, so it's, it's, a, it's a very good time. So I'm supposed to work there uh, full time starting on Monday. I'm supposed to have a, a team working on React. 
with all, all that manpower and sponsoring, I'm pretty sure we're going to have something working. It fades really that we are we really bad. Um, and, and yes, and with React, there's always an uh, issue of do something that, that, that you should do React license. And I, I'm not going to talk about it now because we can talk about it for hours. So if you want to take a beer afterwards, you can talk about licensing issues. Uh, me, from the Jitser point of view, it's very easy. It's an option. If you want to select it, you can do it, and then it's your code. So it's your licensing issue, it's not mine. Um, those are the really big news that I'm pretty sure that there are some other news which are uh, pretty sure of news, but I'm not totally sure what will happen. Uh, which went back, uh, I'm sure the deal is good, but it could be better. I'm pretty sure it could be better. I, had, uh, I did some performance testing with, uh, with uh, someone from Google Paris. Uh, so, we, uh, so, 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 so we did some testing, I'm pretty sure it could be better. And also, what we see with WebPack is that there is a specific configuration for React, a specific configuration for Angular, but it doesn't look like it's very smart, and I would like to have something in common if we can. You know, like we, we inherit from the same stuff, then we do the specific React and specific Angular stuff. It's not done yet. I, I don't really know what we will do here. Um, for the environment, we've got lots of uh, big ideas that are coming. The first one was Jacob spoke about it. A lot of people are thinking about that. To separate our phone and our backup code. A lot of people are already doing it. Uh, it's not very clear because <coughs> that's why you should want it. My first goal is to do it much better, of course. But when you know, of course, you can split them. But when you don't know, it looks very complex. So I'm going to first to do it and then I don't know if you find a good solution for everyone. So that, uh, the second step is uh, support for Google App Object, which is what we are doing. But the good thing is that you just send me an email before coming, and you go to Jinx to app on Google App Engine. So Ludo, I guess, that's supposed to work. I mean, it's uh, you got one working like uh, one hour ago, so, <laughs> <laughs> so that's it. On, I'm pretty sure we, we will have something good. Uh, but what's important with that? Link it to the to Gypsy Online. Is that uh, with Gypsy Online you generate the app now? Then we will add GDL support to so generate entities. And then you can continue clicking and deploy it to Google App Engine. But everything just by clicking. It's just uh, very nice and fun. And of course, when you need to code, well, if you want to do some real business, you will need to code something. But uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good uh, showcase of what you can do. Uh, one last thing, uh, in the bottom, which I'm pretty sure we will have working, is to have a relative of support. So it's an over two server that by with that. Uh, I have you know, like three or four different projects using it with this. Uh, and these two people separately are, are working into uh, making this as a digital complex. Uh, just not working totally yet, but we have so many people using that, and at some point it's going to work. It's, it's more complex I think, than it, what it looks like. It looks easy, but it's not. But with so many people, it should work at some point. Uh, on the build uh, part, uh, we've got some big news from a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we have some level 10 Windows support since uh, the beginning, uh, since a very long time. And uh, our better build, honestly, I wasn't very impressed. It was as good as Maven. You got, you know, you got all those advertisements that Gradle is so much better. And at some point, we, we went to contact the Gradle team and they, do, they did a performance test of what we were doing. And they, they told us they could put up so many documents here. We could improve our build a lot with Gradle. Uh, unfortunately, our engineers <coughs> are due to the Gradle plugin that we use. So it's not our fault, right? The fault is the plugins that we use. So the solution would be to have our own plugin, which looks like really complex and crazy, but there are people who really do it. So that's the beauty of open source. We don't have uh, resource issues. You know, people come and do stuff. So um, and those people would start here. Yeah, so it's not like it's not, it's not cheap stuff. It's like people of the cheap team that want to play this kind of software. Of 
fully develop something uh, working uh, in a couple of months, I guess. And uh, uh, so a lot less people have been read all compared to Maven, but with that, we could have a real time which is a lot better than with Maven. So that could be could improve a lot of developer experience. So that's really important for us. And oh, I forgot to put my demo. <laughs> so normally here, yeah, yeah, okay. So my app started, but this is Eureka. So automatically it's it. Or if I had the get with the case for and so on. And as you see, as you see it should automatically refresh, I'm right? not doing anything else. And uh, I can uh, go to the to metrics. I'm going to have a look at my app. I'm going to refresh time. And for the moment, well, nobody has well. There, there has been some, uh, it's my health check. So there has been some uh, requests, not a lot. So if I go to my app, I'm going to do some, uh, some stupid requests, like lots of reload. And if we go here, yeah, you, see them come, you see them coming. So here I have a central point where I can monitor, configure, and scale my app. Oh, this is also, at the beginning, this was only for monoliths, so that's what uh, we show. Uh, but now for monoliths, it's also very interesting, because uh, if you have a monolith, you know, like, you can put Google app on your know, monolith. Like, don't have. Uh, you want to scale your, mono your monolith. The biggest issue you will have is your high cadence simulable cache, when you have your cache. Because if you want to scale your cache, you need to have something that uh, that uh, tells uh, uh, Atomcast or Infinispan what the other nodes are. So we need some specific code, it's not very complex, but we need that code. So that when you've got a new instance uh, appearing, it goes, uh, while it asks uh, the Jitsio registry, if it has some other instances, and if it sees them, it joins the cache. So with that, we can scale monoliths, including the cache dynamically. Uh, well, we can scale them up or down. And we know the Jitsu registry just can't do it because the, the different instances will not see each other, so it will not work. So that's really important uh, for, for scaling uh, microservice, but also monoliths. So it's getting more and more momentum. By the way, the, on the Docker Hub, this has been the image for the registry has been pulled something like 140,000 times. So it's, yeah, quite a lot of people are using it. That's only the people pulling it with Docker, so that's, there are lots of other ways to, to have the app, I guess, widely used. That's the always same issue with the open source, you don't know what people are doing. Maybe it's the same guy like eating all the time. <laughs> Maybe it's uh, lots of different people, you don't know. Uh, and I don't know how much time I've got left, Romain. Probably the end. You have 10 minutes. I have 10 minutes, oh, yeah, okay. Good to so, well, I still have two slides. Vacation. No, but then, then we can do questions. Uh, we can tell that I have a slide with everything else. Uh, I'm, I'm missing stuff because there are so many people working on Jigstar, I can't follow everything. But this is not part of the main uh, uh, future picture that I see coming. So, the, the first one is uh, uh, related to a full application with the GDL. So, what you saw with the GDL Studio, you can model quantities. There's a huge discussion, there's a huge swell. People want to generate full applications, and even full microservice architecture with it. So you just don't just uh, do quantities, you do architecture with it. It's even bigger. Uh, for microservices, it's quite interesting. And uh, well, there's a really big discussion at the moment on this. And so I guess it's, this will happen. Uh, Oh, that's not really the one, it's not a new feature that I didn't use before. We've got a new Jitter console, which is a Jitter console with a log stash, Kibana, Elasticsearch, that monitors your Jitter uh, applications, uh, with some specific dashboards which are automatically generated for you. So that's a new version which is not much improved compared to what we used to have. Uh, we've got Red Hat, OpenShift, and Infinipad support. So those reports are not done by Red Hat. It's also like, uh, you see we've got uh, uh, Google uh, contributing, we've got Red Hat contribu contributing, uh, we've got uh, so Secret French Bank contributing, we've got more and more companies coming, and not just uh, individual coding stuff. So 
but I would say like two thirds of Bitcoin is done by people who like it, and one third is done by companies uh, because who want to push a product or or they have an interest in it. Oh, and last but not least, we have push rate support. Yeah. Shall we to all the push rates?
Um, okay, so and if you want some more information on GTO, of course, you go to the website. And, oh, and um, on the website, there's one part that I didn't talk about. The more good, it's a bit more and more popular. Uh, but I don't do anything, so it's not, a, not as if I was working on that. Uh, the idea of the boy was that like when I came to Washington, I think it was two years ago, so um, companies and people were, uh, I mean, they liked it, so they wanted to improve it. Um, and so and there were two issues with JSTA. The first one, that maybe we were not uh, agreeing on what they wanted to do. You know, they want to, to do a format on with something totally different, or in a different way. And the second thing is that you don't want to put it in open source. You know, you are in a company, you've got your internal security framework, you want to take it, integrate it, but you don't want to, to have it in open source. So we did the modules, and I select like a little bit of uh, hack on Yeoman. So the module is at the same time a Yeoman uh, generator, but you also hear it from JSTOR. So you, you have all the power of Yeoman, but you've got access to all our uh, functions and variables. So you can integrate into our own API. So you have the same power as what, what we do. But you don't need to, to depend on us. So you can do your own code, and you can even be proprietary code. So at the moment, we've got 40 modules on the marketplace, which are public. Uh, so there are probably others which are not public, but the public ones are already uh, 40. This is growing and growing, but uh, it's also people doing it and not following. So I'm just seeing it grow, I'm happy. But uh, it's uh, outside of James Town. But it's, uh, it's a good place also to, to have a look because there are lots of uh, uh, very uh, surprising things. And we had a discussion uh, this afternoon, and uh, I think it's Dennis uh, uh, who said, ah, there, there's one guy he asked to, to generate his application from the database. And James does not do that. But the module is done by bunch of guys, including just that. With your MySQL schema, you generate your app. It's totally crazy stuff. I don't, I don't know how they did that. So that's very interesting stuff to have a look there. And uh, oh, yes, I forgot to say, we have a new uh, uh, website. It used to be jsort.github.io. I put the domain name uh, last week. So now it's uh, jsort.tech. Smaller. <laughs> Doesn't do much. Uh, okay, do, do you have any questions? Ideas, or you just want to go and grab beers? <laughs> <laughs> Romain, do you place the beers for everyone? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we have beer. We have beer. Ah. No other questions? Because all perfectly clear. Um, they want beer now. Uh -uh. If I were to generate an app using register, then I need to customize or tweak it. Yeah. Uh, how do I then regenerate later from register and maintain? Is there like a separation between my customization? Oh and yeah. So if you uh, but you customize it with your own module, because that's that, that's in fact that's your idea normally. Uh, because um, you will so generate your app on register and customize it yourself. But when you upgrade, you're going to have, uh, well, to, to do, uh, you know, we've got a, a sub-generator for doing upgrades that works with Git. We need to do diffs in Git. So it, it works, but if you have a huge customization at some point, it's not going to, to be that easy. So uh, yeah, the first solution would just do it by hand. And if you do your own module, because it was the idea, the module works after a change stuff. So normally, it should continue to work. And uh, when you do your module, you can either uh, well, do whatever you want. So when you, you, not know, you want to add uh, uh, a new library in your form of XML, you can do it by hand. But the interesting thing is, is that you have access to our API. So you could also add it using our API, which is what we also do. So probably, if you use our API, it's still going to work, because we do the same thing as you. Uh, it's a TV could break our API, but then well, yeah. I don't even think that it, totally, it already happened. Uh, so if you do that, normally, well, you've got the, uh, the same thing as, as us, and your upgrade should be smooth. So um, my use case is more to do with um, 
me extending the GPA repository to become standard with uh, J interpreters. And let's assume I wanted to add a few more uh, methods on top of it. On top of the GPA, uh, yeah. Uh, well, there are several people doing that. Uh, so, in fact, so uh, it depends on the, co the complexity. Uh, but typically, for entities, uh, we often have uh, questions about that because people want to add stuff that we didn't show off. Uh, so, it's either you you override JSTOR uh, and then maybe you will have some trouble when you upgrade. Either what we have more and more is people asking to have new uh, API endpoints. And we add them. Yeah. Of course, we can't add uh, hundreds of them, but, but for the moment, it's no, no problem. And uh, I know somebody wants to add getters and setters or do something with the getters and setters, so we are adding a new API for that. And so, it, as it's following our API, logically, when you have read, it should still work correctly. But it's, uh, it's a common issue for all code generators. It's the upgrades, and the upgrades is really an issue. Uh, there are some people working on uh, totally changing the way it works, and you would only, you know, you would generate code, and you would inherit from it, and you would only work on the inherited code. So that, uh, uh, well, upgrades would be easier. So that's a good idea for example, in Java, it works. In TypeScript, you can probably make it work. But then for your, for your problem XML, your, I don't know, your YAML files, there are lots of things where it will not work. So I'm not totally convinced by that. Uh, as we work, well, personally, I work with Git all the time. You know, I, do, I do Git, uh, I do the upgrade, which is the upgrade, and I do the merge by hand. But for me, it's easy because usually I know what has been changed. For external, external people, uh, may vary. But it's, it's clearly an issue for all code generators. Oh. And then changing it to the profile as a module, yeah. and then uh, using Spring Boot to use my profile as a JDF1. Oh, yes, and you, uh, yeah, okay. But it's the same thing, you use, you extend uh, what's being generated, yeah. so you don't touch what's being generated. Yeah. Well, the people from Belgium, who is the generator from the database, that's what they are doing. They're only working on, on uh, you know, in Java, there is uh, external everything, and they only work on the subclasses. Which is yeah an interesting idea. I had to look at some other code generators which were doing that. But uh, uh, on the other ones, you get more classes. So uh, I guess if you go that way, it would be an option. You know, it's either you have subclass or not. But that's a yeah very common problem for code generators. And then at some point, it's your code. You know, when you chunk everything, it's your own code. Well, anyway, applications today, they only work for a couple of years, so it's okay. <laughs> Especially on the front end, on the front end, it changes so fast. And, uh, when you also try to do it by hand, can follow. But there's a new Angular version, everything is break. It's broken. <laughs> okay, no, no other question? What's your problem? Oh, you can repeat the question. Oh yes. Me. Oh sorry. What's your roadmap for documentation and tutorials? And that's a good question because uh, we haven't written anything. <laughs> but uh, I, I have some. Uh, no, I have a couple of, uh, of answers to that. Uh, so first of all, you know, the documentation. We've got lots of pull requests. You know, people can do pull requests to documentation. Uh, I just add one. Uh, first of what I was doing in the back on the Kafka support. So it's like, you know, when something is uh, popular, uh, I try to document it, but if I don't, usually the community is big enough to document it. Uh, and then, uh, there's a, there are two books of some JS stuff. There's one for Batch Renewal, which is already available, and it's working on the new version. I think it's on this last chapter. So that should be that book, which could be easier than the documentation. And then there's a big book in, uh, done by Pact Publishing, which should be out, I think it's in April. Uh, they haven't finished it yet, because I'm a reviewer, so I know it's it, 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 done all the, all the chapters. 
uh, that should be like a 300 pages book. So that should be, uh, uh, I would say, better than the, it's not better than the documentation, it's another way of, of, uh, of, uh, of putting it up. I see the documentation like a, a dictionary, it tells you, you have this, you have this, you have this. And with the book, you have like a, uh, a novel telling you, okay, here you are start and how you do the rest. It's, uh, it's not the same concept. Uh, it's the same thing with, with Spring, it's not a Spring framework. The documentation is huge and explains everything. And then there are some important parts and some less important parts, but they don't tell it. And then you've got like the word on some books, but it's okay, that's an important thing. And uh, I'd say um, the same way. And I'm quite a bit of two books on, on JSON. So the match readable book is free. The packed book, uh, well, it's, you will sell it because it's a paperback book. Or you know, you can buy it as a, an e-book, I think. But I don't think it's, very, it's going to be very expensive. And you should buy it done by Tiku with the uh, coding of JF So it's going to be really good. And, uh, and, uh, yeah, I hope for the visualization, all that we have, it's already quite, uh, quite a lot. Uh, then, yeah, that's a common issue is that you know, people have tons of questions on JFSTAR, and uh, we have a lot of trouble to, to follow everything, because we have so many people asking. So I, I, like, uh, I have lots of questions on, on Twitter, I just don't have the time to. And so, so short, you know, to get like, it's not working, like, yeah, well, <laughs> I don't even know what you're doing. So now we try to push people to Stack Overflow, uh, well, for real bugs to get up, for questions, but we have, of course, more questions than bugs in the end. We push people to Stack Overflow because it's, uh, uh, you know, it's easy to search, it's, uh, it's voted, but you will get some quality answers. I, we find it a lot better, but we have so many questions on Stack Overflow that uh, uh, you, you can be, uh, you know, drawn in all that information. It's a bit, uh, uh, it's the best solution we have for, for questions, but it's not clearly not good enough. We have to, uh, it's just one so big. I think we have, we have nearly 2,000 questions now, so it's like, uh, uh, and so it's an issue. So people, you know, they don't tell you that the, the versions, what they use, and then it's just like, it's not working. But yeah, it's hard to add sometimes. People also need to remember it's a community project. Most of us are working on our free time on it. So you can't ask too much also for, for, for people. Well, uh, sorry, Rama, should have said. If, if you have some really tough questions, ask people, and we will uh, provide you support. <laughs> <laughs> Completely forgot the business guy here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. No, we, we have customer space. You'll get that. your beers, okay. Ah, yeah, ah, sorry, for the beers. Yeah. You need to pay for support to Roma. But I, I, I don't know if we even have people paying for that today. With professional we services? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, we have a couple of, of uh, customers in the US. Yeah. I remember we, we had one like one year ago on the phone. Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, yeah, it happens. Okay, so we go for B on chat. We clap first. Oh, we clap.